Hello, everyone. We'll give this a, uh, a few minutes and uh, then I'll start yapping away and taking questions. Mm. And I will use these few moments to, um, to, in a somewhat OCD way, optimize the framing of the shot. I think I want, yeah, whatever, this is fine. Let's see. All right. We have, a, I don't know what qualifies as a quorum on an Instagram Live, but we have 37 people, 38 people. So, uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, my name is Adam Strauss, for those of you who do not know me. And I am um, primarily a performer, but my, the, 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 performance piece that has brought me here uh, in conjunction with the SF Psychedelic Society, I have a show called The Mushroom Cure, which is the true story of how I tried to treat my very debilitating obsessive compulsive disorder with psychedelics. And as a result of doing that show, I often have people reaching out to me asking for advice and guidance uh, for using psychedelics, working with psychedelics to treat OCD. So that's really the purpose of this Instagram Live today. So, yeah, you know, in the past, I've started off with a little bit of a, um, a monologue about my experiences, but why don't we just start off with questions? Let's see if anyone has any questions. Those of you who have seen The Mushroom Cure, which currently is about 90 minutes long, but used to be two hours and 20 minutes, know that I have no trouble filling space if no one does have a burning question. So, we'll give it a moment. Um, all right. Yeah, why don't I start talking? Uh, OCD and psychedelics. And, and obviously the first sort of caveat would be this is my own personal experience. I have no, uh, no credentials, uh, no specific training, no real expertise. I am a, uh, I, I have been running my own naturalistic study with an N of one, a subject of one, which is myself. So everything I say today is based on my own firsthand experience, which has advantages, speaking from personal experience, but also the major disadvantages, what applies for me may or may not apply for other people. Having said that, I do think there are some commonalities in how psychedelics seem to work with people with, I, I would say, with addiction. I'm gonna use that term in a broad sense because I view OCD fundamentally as an addiction. And I would define an addiction as a strategy that we use to avoid pain, which works in the very short term, but in the mid to long term, it actually creates more pain, which in turn drives more of the addictive behavior. So a classic example of an alcoholic, they drink, they often feel better, not always, but often they'll feel better for a little bit, but then the booze wears off and they feel worse. And that, in turn, drives them to drink more, to feel better again. It's actually, in a sense, addictions are, are very logical because we do what makes us feel better, at least some of the time. The problem is it doesn't work over longer time frames because, obviously, you're dealing with sort of, there's a compounding effect of pain in an addiction. The first is that, well, let's go back to the alcoholic. Alcohol wears off. They don't just feel the same level of shittiness that they felt before they drank, they actually feel worse. Part of that is a physiological hangover, but part of that is there's often shame around the behavior. There's often real world consequences. You got a DUI, you, uh, you got into a, a, a fight at a bar. And so those consequences in turn make you feel even worse, which in turn increases in a perverse way the incentive to engage in more drinking because the payoff of feeling better is going to be even higher now because you feel even worse. Essentially, the worse you feel, the more potential upside there is in doing something that will make you feel better. So OCD, when I say this, when I tell people sort of this, this addiction metaphor for OCD, often I'll get some pushback. People with OCD will say, well, no, it's not the same because when someone drinks, they feel there's a high there and there's not a high with OCD. But I would argue there actually is a high with OCD. I think any behavior we engage in, no matter how counterproductive it may seem, there has to be some upside, otherwise we wouldn't do it. And with OCD, maybe the word high is, um, 
is not the most apt one, but let's call it relief. There's a payoff there. When someone with OCD engages in OCD behavior or thinking, and I'll break down the distinction between compulsive thinking, or rather compulsive behavior and obsessive thinking, when we engage with that, there is a payoff some of the time, and that payoff is often relief. And sometimes that relief is just the possibility of relief. What I mean by that is someone has, say, contamination fear. They wash their hands. As soon as they walk over to the sink, they may already feel a tiny little bit better just because now there's the possibility that they're going to feel relief. The possibility of relief is, in fact, a form of relief. So a person with contamination anxiety washes their hands. They feel a little bit better. But it doesn't last, of course. Because with OCD, we're looking for absolute certainty and perfection, and that is not to be found, at least not in this plane of existence, in my experience. So yeah, you feel a little bit of relief, but then the doubt sets in. Maybe you missed a spot. Maybe you, when you dried your hands, the towel itself was contaminated. And that drives more anxiety, which in turn increases the incentive to wash your hands again. Again, it's very logical. Do the thing that made you feel good the first time. But of course, as with the alcoholic, there are sort of two levels of compounding pain playing off of each other. The first is the uh, direct effects uh, of the compulsive behavior, which include massive amounts of wasted time, shame, anxiety. And the second are the what I'll call real world effects. You're late to work because you're spending three hours washing your hands or showering before you can leave the apartment. Now you may lose your job. And that, of course, creates even more anxiety, which in turn drives more of the compulsive behavior to try to feel better. Because the thing about OCD is what I've observed for myself and other people is you can look at OCD as both a cause and a response to anxiety. The more we engage in OCD behavior, the more anxious we get. But the more anxious we get, the more we engage in OCD behavior. And this holds true even if the source of ang our anxiety is not actually an OCD trigger. So again, the person with contamination fear, losing their job is not an OCD trigger for them, but it causes distress and that in turn will drive more OCD behavior the same way an alcoholic will pick up a drink when they're feeling distressed, whatever the cause of that distress is. So really what I'm saying in perhaps more words than is strictly necessary is it's a vicious cycle. Uh, why don't we take some questions? All right. Uh, these scroll by fast, so I'm not going to back up. I'm just going to read whatever's in front of me. So if someone asked a question earlier and I did not address it, just ask it again. Diego asks, can you touch on times that psychedelics have maybe made your OCD worse in the short term? <laughs> yeah, let's go to the uh, the downsides. Um, I, I, I'm laughing because I feel like, not that I'm presuming that Diego has OCD, but I know for people with OCD, often our first tendency is to focus on what could go wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. You know, it's just an orientation. And without getting too far afield into evolutionary biology, I think it makes sense to have at least some members of the tribe be the ones looking at those bushes and being like, oh, what, what, if there's a, what if there's a tiger in there? While the other people are like, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Anyway, made my OCD short in worse in the short term. Um, yeah, one, well, getting back to what I just said. So if we accept the idea that OCD is a cause and an effect of anxiety, any source of anxiety, whether or not it's one of our OCD triggers, will lead to more OCD, as long as we're kind of trapped in our OCD addiction and haven't found freedom from that. So certainly I've had trips, and one in particular comes to mind, that greatly increased my anxiety. And in the aftermath, I don't mean during the trip. I often have anxiety during trips. That's sort of part of the experience for me. I mean, this was a quote unquote bad trip, a very challenging experience. I didn't integrate it well. And in the aftermath, I experienced heightened anxiety for probably a couple of months after. And in that aftermath, for those couple of months, absolutely, I was, I was, the OCD was significantly worse because I was feeling more anxiety. So I was picking up my drug of choice, OCD, to try to feel better. Um, yeah, so uh, that's not so much a specific. Again, all we're seeing there is anxiety leads to more OCD. And, and so, yes, I would say in my experience, 
psychedelic experiences like any other experience in life that elevates our anxiety can lead to more OCD in the short term. Um, someone else asks, have you heard of microdosing or psychedelics in general helping with trichotillomania, which is hair pulling? I don't, um, I haven't heard specific reports of that. I'm trying to think as I'm saying that I feel like someone did reach out to me with stories about that. Um, no, I haven't heard specific reports, but I have no reason to think that trichotillomania would be any different than any form of OCD slash addiction. So the way psychedelics essentially can short circuit the OCD addictive pattern is in my case, and again, this may or may not apply to other people, is psychedelics, the single biggest and most concrete beneficial effect psychedelics have had for me has been putting me in touch with my body. And we hear that phrase a lot in the psychedelic community. So let me be very specific. I have much more awareness of my physical sensations, my emotions in my body, because that's what an emotion is. An emotion is simply a physical sensation, which by definition resides in the body. And with OCD, I was completely cut off from these sensations. I was totally unaware of what was happening. If, I mean, if someone said, are you anxious? I could say yes. But in terms of actually experiencing that in my body, I had no ability slash willingness to do that. And in fact, I believe I developed OCD after a particular trauma because it was too scary to be in my body. It was too scary to feel these sensations of fear and loss in my body. So my brain helpfully said, hey, just go hang out up here. You know, we'll just figure everything out up here and then you don't have to worry about what's going on in your body. You don't have to experience these painful sensations. So by the time I started working with psychedelics, I was so deep into this OCD um, trip, really. It is its own form of, uh, of trip, I would say. I was so deep in that, that reality and so removed from my body that um, psychedelics just kind of brought me back to my physical experience, which was terrifying at times, but ultimately liberating because once... So the way out of OCD... Ultimately, and this is what cognitive behavioral therapy is predicated upon as well, is, you know, you have these physical sensations that we don't want with OCD, fear, essentially. And so our brain tries to figure out everything, fix everything, get everything perfect with the illusion that if we can figure things out in our brain, the physical sensation will change. The fear will dissipate. But it doesn't work that way because the more you try to figure things out in your brain, the more you realize you can't get it perfect, not the level of perfection that OCD wants. And that in turn drives more anxiety, which drives more obsessing and more compulsive behavior. So the way to short circuit this OCD um, pattern is quite simple. And again, this is what cognitive behavioral therapy is predicated on as well. It's to actually feel the emotions that you don't want to feel. It's not to figure out the obsession. It's to feel the sensations and the primary sensation with OCD for me. And I believe probably for everyone with OCD is fear. And I understood this before I began working with psychedelics because I had seen some very gifted cognitive behavioral therapists and they would explain to me that if I was able and willing to feel my fear, my anxiety, it wouldn't control me. But, um, Understanding this intellectually didn't help me because acceptance is not an intellectual process. Acceptance does not take place in our brain. Our brain can help acceptance or it can hinder it. And I can talk more about this, but acceptance ultimately takes place in the body. It is a physical allowing more than anything else. One could argue it also takes place in the spirit or the soul. I'm not going to go there because those terms are so hard to define, but I will say at the deepest levels, acceptance does have a spiritual aspect. It is that leap of faith, that, that uh, infinite surrender, if you will. But to keep it more concrete, it's primarily a physical experience. It's allowing these sensations slash emotions in the body that we really, really don't want to be there, allowing them to be there, and in fact, even welcoming them in a way. That's where I'm at now with my, uh, my anxiety, is I really try to welcome it. Because I believe it's not my enemy, it's actually my friend. 
I think emotions have a lot of data in them. They're information rich. This is my own theory. There's probably smarter and more knowledgeable people have talked about this, but I believe that when I'm experiencing an intense emotion, there is an opportunity to learn. And I don't, ha I don't learn what I need to learn by thinking about the emotion. All I have to do is fully open up to it at a physical level, and I will learn what I need to learn, what this emotion is trying to teach me. So that's my ideal orientation towards fear and loss. I say fear and loss because to me those are the dominant quote-unquote negative emotions that we try to avoid, that I try to avoid. So I try to instead really welcome them. And I say try because there's times when I'm not willing to do that. There's times when, um, yeah, I, I, I'm reflecting because I actually dealt with one two days ago where I was under a lot of deadline pressure for something. I was feeling a lot of anxiety and, and I just didn't want to accept it. I did not want to accept it. I was fighting against it. So, but that, that is, I'm a little bit all over the place, but to, to bring this back to the specifics of OCD and psychedelics, the single biggest and most concrete way psychedelics have really changed my life and changed my relationship with OCD has been by, have been by putting me in touch with my physical experience so that I then have the opportunity to accept that experience. I may not always take that opportunity. There may be times where I still go to OCD, where I still try to figure it out in my head. But more and more, I am willing to experience what's happening in my body, these emotions of fear and loss. And when I do that, I'm effectively undercutting the incentive to engage in OCD because the whole point of the OCD in my head is it wants to change these emotions. But if I'm willing to accept the emotions, then there's no real reason to engage in OCD. Effectively, what's happened when I accept is the thing the OCD is afraid of. See, OCD tells us it's, it's afraid of very specific outcomes. It's afraid we're going to burn the house down if we leave the stove on. It's afraid we're going, to get a, we're going to get a disease if we don't wash our hands well enough. Or my form of OCD. Uh, it's afraid that we're going to have catastrophic, catastrophic consequences if we make the quote-unquote wrong decision. I primarily have decision-making OCD. But really, what OCD is afraid of is just sensations in our body, these fear sensations. So you accept the sensation, you're basically completely taking the air out of the OCD. And again, I understood this intellectually before I started using psychedelics because this is the idea behind a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, but I wasn't able to do this physical experience, this rather physical acceptance until I started using psychedelics because I just didn't have the access to my body effectively is what it came down to. So, um, I don't even remember what the question was, but, uh, hopefully I addressed it. So yes, let's see if there are more questions. Yeah. Someone points out, it feels like a helicopter parent, you know, it's trying to help you, but yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. Um, I, I sometimes think of the OCD as like a really, really, hypervigilant bodyguard. Its aim is to try to keep us perfectly safe and perfectly healthy and perfectly comfortable and perfectly happy. It just doesn't realize that in trying to do that, it actually makes us much less comfortable and happy and healthy and, and useful to the world. So I, I hear people very often talking about OCD as the enemy. And for me, I, I really don't see it that way. I see it as just kind of a very misguided friend, or as someone just said, helicopter parent. Um, any tips for integration post-trip? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I would go with the standard stuff there. Um, you know, for me, I, I like to trip in a setting where I have access to nature. And I like to integrate in that same, it doesn't have to be the same setting, but nature for me is, is, is what I prefer. But, you know, I think the biggest thing is just carving out space and time for yourself, not jumping, excuse me, not jumping back in immediately to your sort of, uh, your, your default reality and obviously reflecting, um, can be huge journaling. I mean, everything I'm saying is sort of integration 101, but yeah, journaling, super helpful, um, nature, quiet, some degree of solitude, though sometimes integration really calls for sharing with other people as well. So 
someone asks, uh, I said, badly integrated, what makes the difference for good integration in your experience? Okay, so when I said badly integrated, this was a particular trip where uh, it, I got, it was way stronger than I expected. Uh, I think I talked about this particular trip in a, in a past Instagram live. It was on a very, very high, uh, recklessly high dose of 2CE, a synthetic phenethylamine. One of Alexander Shulgin's magical half dozen, for those of you who are into that sort of thing. And um, a, a molecule I have a great deal of respect for. But yeah, I was reckless and I had, a, basically what happened is I had a threatening thought on this trip. And of course, the way to deal with threatening thoughts on a trip or not on a trip, really, and this actually does play, come back to OCD, it's, the same, it's acceptance. It's, oh, okay, this thought is coming into my mind. I may not want this thought, but it's coming in and trying to get rid of it or argue with it is going to just strengthen it. But in this case, on this particular 2CE trip, this thought was terrifying to me and I just kind of tried to push it away and that just made it stronger. And um, the poorly integrated part was basically, I didn't have any real integration. It was sort of a traumatic psychedelic experience. I talked about it with some people but I felt pretty scarred and it, it did take a few months for me to, I would say fully integrate that trip in a way that I actually wound up seeing it as something very helpful without getting to the specifics of the thought. It had to do with God, death, all the classic things. And uh, I now look back on that trip and that thought as something that there was some truth to it, but I was not at a point where I was able to um, engage with that thought in a way that was helpful. Let's see. Um, yeah, someone says healthy eating and yoga, uh, helpful integration techniques. Yeah, I mean, I, I maybe I should say this is I don't have a super regimented prescription for integration because I think a lot of my daily practices are 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 what I do. I mean, the day maybe I should talk about this. The daily practices that I find really the foundation of my recovery from OCD and just my foundation for being a. Um, a functioning, generally quite happy, um, relatively productive, and I hope of service to other people, human being, there, there's a handful of practices. Uh, meditation, I do just basic, you know, just sitting shikatanza. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, meditation every morning for uh, 22 minutes, a sort of OCD number, but that was the number I came up with that seemed optimal. Um, prayer. Prayer is very important. I'm happy to talk more about this. To me, prayer does not have to presuppose uh, belief in any specific deity or anything like that. It's just an incredibly powerful practice for clarifying what I truly desire and also clarifying what I can control and what I can't control. Because in a sense, so much of OCD comes down to us trying to control things we can't. So I meditate. 22 minutes, then I go straight into prayer. That's what I do first thing every morning. Uh, at night, uh, then I journal. And then at night, I do um, what in a 12-step program would be called an inventory. I take note of things that I feel I did well during that day and things I feel I didn't do well during that day. Uh, not well like, oh, I, you know, I was happy with my performance at the at this theater tonight. Well, that poorly in the sense of I was, I felt, felt like I showed up in the way I wanted to show up to this situation, or I didn't show up the way. And that, and then I do more prayer around that, basically where I fall short of my own ideals for myself, uh, my own values, then I kind of analyze, not in an OCD way, but just kind of look at it. How could I, how could I have done better? And then often pray around that as well. So this sort of practice of self-assessment, I feel like is very helpful because um, yeah, I can lose perspective with OCD. I can, I, I can, I can, I can be blind to my own failings or conversely, I can make myself out to have done things much worse than, than reality. So, uh, someone gave a, a P call shout out. Yep. Great book. Very influential for me. Um, all right. I don't know if there's any other questions or oh, I was going to monitor time in the past. These have gone like an hour and a half, I think. All right, we're good. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I could talk about a few other ways that psychedelics have been helpful for me with OCD. So again, way number one, short circuiting this whole pattern where we're trying to avoid our anxiety by engaging in obsessive thinking or compulsive behavior, but we're actually compounding it. We're making it worse, which drives more obsessive thinking and compulsive behavior. And the way psychedelics short circuit that effectively for me is by simply facilitating acceptance, by putting me in touch with my body so I can accept the fear and loss that the OCD, the entire reason for the OCD's existence is to get rid of that fear and loss. But again, it just makes it worse. Um, so that's the first way. Uh, another way is insight, I think, can be helpful. People ask me a lot about that. I, I have had helpful insights about OCD and psychedelics, but to me, that's far less important than the acceptance piece. And I think part of that is because I had a lot of insight on my OCD before I began working with psychedelics. People with OCD almost by definition tend to be hyper analytical. And I have never met anyone with OCD who hasn't tried to OCD the shit out of their OCD, by which I mean really tried to figure out their OCD. That to me is a trap that everyone with OCD I know falls into to some extent is, oh, I'm just going to figure out exactly what my mind's doing and then I'm going to fix the OCD. So certainly insight can be helpful, but I don't think it, for me, did not really bring much healing from OCD. And that seems to be the case with most people I've talked to. However, where it has been helpful on psychedelics is really seeing the impact of my OCD in a way I hadn't before. Because psychedelics, of course, one of the beautiful things they do is beautiful is maybe not exactly the right word word um uh i'd say uniquely beneficial experiences or aspects of the psychedelic experience is the shift in perspective where you are experiencing your own existence in sometimes a radically different way sometimes a subtly different way but there's a sort of disidentification that can take place with your normal default default mode of thinking and existence. And when you have that little bit of separation, that little shift, you can suddenly see yourself in a new light. And one thing I saw was, wow, I'm really fucking sick. And I use the word sick, not in a judgmental sense, but in the way you'd say, oh, this person is sick with uh, the flu. You know, it was just something that I had and it was easy for me to justify rationalize, minimize, and psychedelics really brought that reality home. So that was beneficial. Um, and the third way psychedelics have been helpful for me is, so with OCD, I've talked about this before, in a sense, OCD is a crisis of trust. Because with OCD, we don't really trust anyone else, right? People can give us reassurance. Oh, no, you're, you, of course, you're not going to... Um, you're not going to, uh, you know, you, you didn't leave the stove on. You're not going to burn down the house. But we need to check ourselves. We don't trust anyone else fully. No matter how many times our spouse or, or friend checks the stove and tells us it's off. Well, what if they what if they weren't paying enough attention? What if they got distracted? What if they jostled the stove themselves as they walked past? Let me check again. So we don't really trust anyone else. But ultimately, we also don't trust ourselves. I mean, if we really trusted ourselves, you'd look at the stove once and say, yep, it's off. I'm done. So it's impossible to exist in the world without some degree of trust and psychedelics for me. And I think this is true of many people can, can, um, bring about this sense of the best way I can put it for me is a deep sense of order and intelligence underlying reality. I may not know what that order intelligence is. Maybe some people would call it God. Some people might call it quantum physics. I try not to call it anything because when I start calling it something, I make it into a thing and then that becomes a whole, a whole nother trip. But there has been a deep sense of there is something here I can trust. There is something going on, even if I don't know exactly what it is. And that can be a foundation for healing, I believe. All right. Someone asked, are we talking long-term microdosing or dosing a few times a year or weekends? Um, yeah. Uh, well, so the way I use psychedelics was at the peak or nadir, depending on your perspective of my, uh, you know, hell bent quest to cure myself with psychedelics. I was tripping pretty high, high dose trips, probably twice a month. I would not recommend that. Um, it, it, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Now I, 
but that was years ago. Um, that was the time that I recounted the mushroom cure. Now I would say I trip. It varies a lot, but a few times a year, you know, um, there have been times where I'll, you know, say, particularly with ayahuasca, where you can kind of do it a lot in quick succession. There might be exceptions where I do it more often, but generally, um, I would say once every three or four months, uh, micro microdosing, I've not personally found helpful. Um, I know people who have found it very helpful for depression. I, I don't know people who have found it helpful for OCD, but I also don't know that many people who have tried it for OCD. The only other thing I always feel compelled, no pun, not a pun, but you know, <laughs> compulsions. I feel compelled to mention whenever I'm talking about microdosing is I do, th there is a theoretical risk of cardiotoxicity with microdosing. There is a risk of heart issues with microdosing. It's a theoretical risk. It has not been observed in humans. It has been observed in some animal studies. And so I wouldn't say that's a reason to not do microdosing if it's helpful, but I, I do think it shouldn't be viewed as, oh, this is, there's, there's no potential downside. My own belief is there probably is a small, but very small risk of heart issues with microdosing. Essentially what it comes down to is we know psychedelics occasionally at a high doses are organically essentially completely safe when you're talking about classical psychedelics, uh, mescaline, cactus, um, LSD, mushrooms, ayahuasca, that sort of thing. But just because something is safe at high doses occasionally does not mean it's safe at low doses chronically. So I don't want to alarm people. Again, I think the risk, if it exists, is small. But I, I don't really hear people talking about this risk when they talk about microdosing. And I feel like if we're committed to harm reduction, then that risk needs to be um, needs to be mentioned. So um, someone asked, do they say microdosing LSD is potentially more risky than something in mushrooms than uh, mushrooms in terms of heart issues? I don't know the answer to that. Um, the study, I know there was a study of, I believe it was DOB, one of, I think that was one of Shulkin's chemicals where there was some heart valve mis, uh, dysfunction. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, and my, my guess is we don't know. Again, this is just a risk. Matthew Johnson at Hopkins has, has spoken about this far more eloquently and knowledgeably and intelligently than I ha can. But it's, there's reason to believe based on the physiology of how psychedelics work that taking them very often, even at low doses, could cause some, I believe it's heart valve issues. There may be other, other cardiac issues. Um, that's all I know. So yeah, uh, to be very clear, if microdosing was very helpful for me, I would do it despite those risks because I don't think the risks are that high. But again, I just think, yeah, whenever I'm talking about it, I'm going to mention the fact that it, there does exist this potential risk there. So, um, yeah, so yeah, we'll look at Matthew Johnson. Um, he talks about it. I'm trying to think who else is, I've had, I've had offline conversations with a bunch of people about this. Um, Hamilton Morris is the one who first kind of clued me into this issue, but I don't know who's actually written about it or posted about it, but I know Matthew Johnson has. And I think I retweeted him talking about this. So you could probably find it that way. Um, yeah, someone says physical risks are pretty low compared to the potential benefit in most cases. And I, I would tend to agree with that. So, but there is a physical risk there that simply does not exist. The good thing about the whole drug war is we have a tremendous amount of data on the safety of psychedelics because there was so much study of, oh, trying to demonize psychedelics that actually found the opposite, that found that this stuff is incredibly safe at a physical level. Again, talking about classical psychedelics. So that's what we know. Um, someone asked, did I work with a professional in, who's using psychedelics as a tool specifically addressing OCD? No, um, I didn't. So I was, again, this was the, most of my experiences that I talked about in the Mushroom Cure about 10 years ago. So this was before this whole sort of psychedelic renaissance fully flowered. There were not as many guides. I didn't know guides then. Uh, so I was doing this on my own. I have subsequently had a couple of guided journeys that, yeah, I personally, I did not find them more helpful than um, 
than unguided journeys. And in fact, I think when I, I, I see people, some people who, who only have guided journeys and to each his or her own, but I do feel like you might be missing out on something. The deepest experiences I've had, and I'd say the most healing have actually been solo experiences. I think there's a way to experience the medicine that having anyone else there can potentially act as a buffer in a way that can be unhelpful. Having said that, I think if someone doesn't have a lot of experience with psychedelics or really wants to, I don't think there's anything wrong with working with a guide. And I think for most people, it is better to work with a guide if you have that option available. I would just say also do some journeys without a guide. I think th there's a lot to be gained from that too. Someone asked me to talk about Salvia. Um, yeah, I haven't done Salvia in, in a decade. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't want to get into a whole trip report. I, it was, it's, it was a weird, uh, it was a weird drug for me. Medicine, whatever you want to call it. Um, I have respect for its power. I, I don't, yeah, I guess my honest answer is I, I can't claim to ha have had enough experience with it to be able to speak with any sort of authority or intelligence. Um, it was just too out there for me to get, have a sense that I was getting anything useful from it. But I know people who have found it very useful um, in the leaf form. You know, I, I smoked it, but the, the chewing it or putting it between the gums, I don't even know exactly how you do it, but it's a much more long lasting experience. Um, yeah, someone said they find the whole idea of a sitter intrusive. I think if you have a good sitter, they won't be intrusive. They will just kind of be off there, you know, and there if you want them. I think that's part of the skill, actually, of really being a guide. And one thing I worry about when I see so many people hanging up their shingles as psychedelic guides who have no real training. Um, because, yeah, the, the skill and the art, I would say, of guiding is 90% of it is, is just leaving space for the person to have their own experience. All right. Let's see. Um... trying to think if there's any questions I skipped over. Well, anyone has questions, pop them in there. We'll go for another, what is it? Go for another 15 minutes. We'll make this one an even, an even hour or so. Or we can just look into each other's eyes. Mm. Because I mentioned 12 steps, how does the program and the use of psychedelics work together for you if they do? Yeah, so my exposure to the 12-step thing is through, there is a 12-step OCD program called Obsessive Compulsive Anonymous that I did diligently for years and found, I would say life-changing, extraordinarily helpful. I think the 12 steps and psychedelics complement each other extremely well. And in fact, if you know the history of AA, uh, Bill, Bill W., the founder of AA, his first spiritual experience was on Belladonna, which I don't think is classic psych. It's not a classic psychedelic. I don't think it's technically a psychedelic. It, it may be more, is it more of a dissociative, a delirium? But anyway, he had an altered, he was in an altered state when he had his whole spiritual experience, which was the foundation of AA. And then later, Bill W. tried LSD and found it so profoundly helpful that he advocated for making LSD part of the official Alcoholics Anonymous program. This sounds like some far out, you know, sort of something I, I read in some obscure Reddit forum, but no, this is well documented. Bill W., the founder of AA, wanted LSD to be a cornerstone of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, and it occasioned this whole big fight within AA where pit board members were threatening to resign. Eventually, Bill W. backed off. This is all to say that there is a long-standing history of psychedelics and 12-step groups. And yeah, I think they work together beautifully. I think, you know, I, I don't want to generalize too much from my psychedelic experiences, but part of the psychedelic experience for me has been accountability, seeing the impact my actions have on other people, which is very much a part of the 12-step thing, uh, developing a sense of trust and faith and... Um, at the core for me of recovery through both 
12-step and psychedelics is, let's get back to the buzzword for today, surrender, acceptance. That's really what it's about. So I've actually advocated for people who don't have, because you do, you do want some sort of integration framework. I will say that. I think guides can be helpful, but not necessary, but some sort of integration framework, particularly if you're working with psychedelics to deal with something as, as um, challenging as OCD can be very helpful. And Psychedelic Society, the SF Psychedelic Society offers integration circles, which are great, but for people who don't have access to that, I feel like a 12-step group can be a good sort of proxy integration circle. You may not be able to talk about your psychedelic experiences, but being in a community of people who are working towards recovery through acceptance, I think, can be extremely helpful. What dose do I recommend for raw shrooms for a full transcendental experience? 22 and a half grams will get you a full transcendental experience 100% of the time. I guarantee it. No, I'm joking. I can't tell you that. I don't know. It's, you know, dosing is so idiosyncratic and individual. And also psychedelics are idiosyncratic, by which I mean the same dose of the same psychedelic in the same setting can give you a very different experience. Uh, I talked about this recently, I think on a podcast where I take large doses. I was on SSRIs for many, many years. I've been off for over a decade now, but I still seem to have a high tolerance. For those who are not aware, SSRIs tend to, um, SSRIs mean Prozac, Paxil, those sort of medications. They tend to blunt the effects of psychedelics. So people on SSRIs often can't trip at all, or they have these sort of muted trips. And I couldn't trip at all when I was on SSRIs. In fact, what ultimately got me off of SSRIs was the desire to fully experience the effects of psychedelics. But even now, I still do require very high doses. But I recently had, so like, you know, eight grams of dried mushrooms is going to be a strong trip for me, but very manageable typically. But I had a trip this summer where I took two grams of a dose that I'd, a batch I'd done before and got blown out of the fucking water. So that's to say that I can't say, you know, there's this this dose will deliver this experience. It's not that linear. Psychedelics are radically nonlinear compared to other drugs. Every other, and I, I want to talk about the drug thing because people sometimes object it's medicine. To me, it's, I have a stand-up bit about this where, yeah, it's medicine, but it's weird medicine. Let's keep psychedelics weird. Don't reduce it to this sort of, you know, take two and call me in the morning. So, um, yeah, with, you know, most other substances, you'll have a fairly reliable experience taking the same dose, not so with psychedelics. Uh, my best advice, if you want a transcendental experience, to, to use the phrase that person using the question or any other type of experience, would be the classic, you know, start low, go slow. You can always take more, you can never take less. I have had very challenging and dysphoric psychedelic experiences by taking far too much. And, um, if you're going, if you're going for a blow me out of the water trip, that's fine. But, you know, know that that's, that that's what you're going for rather than mistakenly feeling like, oh, this isn't going to be that strong. Um, let's see. Yeah. Someone says their mom had a full ego death on 1.5 grams. Yeah. Yeah. You can, um, it's, it, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very hard to generalize. All right. Mm -mm. Nine minutes left. We can also wrap up early if no one has burning questions. You know, I, I got a busy schedule, guys. I, uh, I, no, I don't. It's the lockdown. I got nothing going on. Yeah, I guess I will say, someone said, looking for a strong trip. I have, yeah, I would say I have found stronger trips to be more beneficial than milder trips. I'm always hesitant to say that, though, because my mindset when I was really on this sort of hell-bent OCD quest was, I need this plus four on the Shogun scale. I need this ego death experience to heal. And I've had that experience more fully probably on 5-MeO-DMT. Yeah, I don't buy into that anymore. I, I think there can be healing and benefits at all dose levels and all uh, intensities. But I think the virtue of a strong trip for someone with OCD is with OCD, again, our tendency is always going to be to go up into our heads and try to figure out everything, manipulate everything, engineer everything, orchestrate everything, get everything perfect, control in a word, control everything. 
and at a higher dose, it's harder to hold on to that illusion. I've actually had some unpleasant trips at lower doses where it's been like, I'm trying to control, but I can't really. Whereas with higher doses, it can kind of force surrender in a way that a lower dose can't. I actually often find higher doses less anxiety provoking than lower doses once I'm kind of in the trip. The come up can be can be bumpy, but you know, that's part of the experience. How many trips did it take for me to experience relief from OCD? So the short answer, because yeah, uh, I'll keep this short. It's hard for me to say because I wasn't a very good controlled su scientific subject. You know, I was doing a lot of different psychedelics in a short time frame at different dose levels. But the general pattern for me is, so again, I mentioned this earlier, the primary way that psychedelics benefited me initially, and I would say still, is by connecting me to my body so I can feel the emotions of my body. So I therefore have the opportunity to accept those emotions rather than trying to change them or control them by obsessing and compulsing, which is what OCD wants me to do. So generally I had this experience when I began working with psychedelics of, oh, I'm feeling these emotions, I'll accept them, I would find some freedom, but it wouldn't last that long. So I'd, I'd get freedom for a day, two days, three days. And it was sort of a, a gradual accrual of experiences that I think changed things for me more than any single experience. I did had some, did have one or two particularly intense experiences that seemed to really shift things. But yeah, looking back, I, what I really see is over many trips, I basically learned this skill of tapping into my physical experience, breathing in the anxiety, allowing the loss to be there, and therefore undercutting the OCD. And by doing that more and more while tripping, that started to generalize when I wasn't tripping. It's kind of like practicing a skill in a way. It's an odd way to look at it because our model of psychedelic healing, at least in pop culture, is more this, you know, great catharsis. You have this ego death experience and everything is different. And yeah, I mean, the, the biggest ego death experience I ever had, I came out of it. Well, first I was surprised because I thought, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to come out of it. And I was totally cool with that. You know, I'd become the whole universe. I thought there was nothing to come out of. I'd seen the truth of reality. But then when I did come out of it, I was like, okay, I'm fixed. And I was fixed for about a day. And then there's the, what is it? A Jack Cornfield book after the, I haven't, I haven't read the book after the ecstasy, the laundry, you know, you go back to regular life. So, so I'd say for me, the massive tectonic experiences not much more valuable than the the more um, sort of prosaic experiences of, of acceptance. It was really that practicing that skill of acceptance again and again. Um, let's see. If someone is freaking out, give them a long, gentle hug. Depends, man. I mean, sometimes people don't like to be tr touched, but, uh, but yeah, physical touch uh, can be extremely healing on psychedelics and off of it. So any preventative tips on taking psychedelics? I've taken shrooms and LSD and will vomit every time. Yes, this is very basic stuff, but I forget this all the time. So I will say this, don't eat, don't eat. For me, the single biggest determinant of how my experience is going to go in terms of comfort and often, well, comfort, yeah, in terms of is how much food is in my stomach. I mean, obviously set and setting are key, but after that, food in my stomach empty stomach, I generally have a much more comfortable experience and not just physically, but often emotionally than if I, uh, if I have even a little bit of food in my stomach. So for me, uh, I eat a lot. I'm one of these people, I'm hungry a lot and I eat a lot, but so fasting for three hours is a long time and I'll make sure I do at least that before taking a psychedelic. Um, let's see. Yeah, someone said, I hug and send love to anything dark I come across. Yeah, that's beautiful. That That is, a to me, is, again, we're back to acceptance and to active acceptance, not just saying, okay, I'm going to let this be here, but I love the way um, Love Appreciate Forgive, who I'm seeing your username now, fits in perfectly with what you wrote, put it where, yeah, sending love to those things, sending love to the OCD. I mean, I've certainly done that on trips and off of trips too, is talking to it like a frightened little little kid, just being like, hey, I know you're trying to protect me. 
I know you're really scared right now. I know it's really, it's really rough right now, but it's okay. It's okay. Just sending reassurance to those parts of us that so desperately want it. Again, the OCD, it just wants to keep us safe and happy. It doesn't realize how much harm it's doing. I really believe it's just trying to be our friend. Let's see. <laughs> Eat an apple. <laughs> I don't know if that's a reference to my name, Adam. Um, uh, oh, are we talking about the nausea? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, just staying away from food before tripping and during tripping seems to be the most reliable thing, but everyone is different. Some people do find light snacking helpful. Post-tripping, I've had some spectacular spectacular, spectacularly enjoyable meals. Not even meals, just eating blueberries. Um, have I heard about the new psychoactive that have DMT and psilocybin? No, I've not heard. I mean, I've heard of people combining those things. I've heard of people taking uh, DMT hits at the peak of a mushroom trip. I've not done that. Um, so can't speak to that. Someone suggests cacao and mushrooms. I have not done that, though I do know people who swear by cacao. I have not found cacao uh, particularly psychoactive for me, but maybe I haven't done enough. <clears throat> I will wait for a few more questions. Oh, yeah. I think we're almost at an hour here. Um, <laughs> someone, oh, someone, they're going to, yeah, they're going to be sharing some, someone asked mushroom microdosing tips. So I'm going to post this to the SF Psychedelic Society page and you can watch earlier. I addressed that, but essentially, uh, I've not found microdosing helpful. I haven't, to be fair, I haven't done it that much, but I did do the Fatiman, you know, regimen with mushrooms for six weeks or so. And then I did a shorter run of LSD microdosing. I didn't find either of them particularly helpful, um, but there is a wealth of information on microdosing out there. And the Psychedelic Society, you know, has a microdosing course. I don't know much about what they're doing, but I know Jim uh, Fatiman is involved in that. So I'm sure that would be an excellent resource. Why do some people feel like being electrocuted from taking LSD? you felt like you were dying. I wonder if, did you mean you had like specific electrical sensations? I've gotten very intense physical sensations on LSD and mushrooms, but not unpleasant ones. Um, which public company do I feel is doing the best work in the psychedelic space? None of them, none of them. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to, I, yeah, I think the best work in the psychedelic space is clearly coming from the, the nonprofits by public. I assume this person means publicly traded companies. But, you know, you look at uh, Hefter, Usona, MAPS, um, full disclosure, they sponsor my show. But, you know, I was a huge fan of theirs before then. I, I, I don't want to get into this uh, sidetracked here. I'm not opposed to people making money off of offering psychedelic medicines per se. In fact, I think it's probably necessary for us to reach the number of people who can benefit from this therapy in a capitalist society, we need to appropriate the mechanisms of capitalism in terms of distribution and all of that. But, you know, clearly the, the groundwork was laid by these nonprofit companies who have been working for decades. And now what we're seeing is suddenly the other people who had, had no involvement in this space whatsoever until two years ago see that, oh, there's money to be made and they're piling in. And if I sound a little bit cynical and dismissive, I am. But ultimately, I don't think it's inherently a bad thing for people to, for capitalism. <laughs> Listen, I would love it if we didn't need capitalism at all to bring psychedelic therapy to the masses. But in a capitalist society, I do believe it's inevitable. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, any recommendations for journal prompts during mushroom trips? No, no I mean, for me, um, some trips, there's very little... Um, linguistic content. There's very little that I want to write or even sometimes not even a lot of uh, verbal thoughts in my head. Other trips, it's just mm, 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 mm. so um, I would say go where the trip takes you. You know, don't feel obligated to journal. But yeah, always when I when I'm tripping, I always have I have it here. I have a little voice recorder um, that I can talk into and I have a paper journal at hand. 
how long does it take to get your tolerance back to the normal, uh, normal dose? I know it all depends, but how many days if you've taken cubes, cubensis, and LSD, uh, I lost this, and LSD quite a, quite a bit in microdosing. So in my experience, so I, I trip, my, my trips are space far apart now, but when I was doing it more frequently, I found, um, surprisingly with mushrooms, I, I remember there was one time when I was able to trip two days in a row. Uh, there was another time where I tripped separated by one day and I didn't notice a big diminution in effects. LSD, I did. Um, everyone's different. I'm not an expert on that. So, all right. Cool. So I'm going to close this out. And by the way, thank you for the people who have just said nice things about me. I want to, I can't read them out loud because that feels sort of egotistical, but it makes me happy inside because I have an ego. We all do. So, um, yeah, in closing, what would I like to leave people with? Acceptance. That's the game. That's the game, uh, or, or the way out of the game, I would say, of OCD is acceptance and surrender. If you have OCD, your mind is trying to protect you from feeling feelings that you don't want to feel. And if you allow yourself to feel those feelings, you will gain freedom from OCD. I'm certain of it. It's just logical. I don't mean perfect freedom. It is an addiction. And once an addiction sets in, it, um, I think it's hard to totally eradicate it. But, you know, I was thinking about this recently where my OCD is much better, but it can flare up sometimes. And, you know, I don't, I really don't see it as the enemy. And it also, there have been gifts of it. And the biggest gift for me has been humility. I think pain leads to humility and I am a, um, and humility leads to compassion. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, make friends with your OCD. You don't, which is very different than appeasing it, but realize that it's trying to help you out and that if you're able to and willing to accept, you can find a lot of freedom. And that essentially is where I've found psychedelics to be so helpful is in enabling that acceptance, but you still need to be willing to accept. I can't emphasize this enough. And I think the reason I want to emphasize it so much is because for me, when I first started using psychedelics, I was like, okay, this is going to fix me. No, what I would say is psychedelics gave me a choice. Before working with psychedelics, I didn't have the choice to accept my emotions because I was too disconnected from my body. Psychedelics connected to me, me to my body so that now I can choose to accept. But again, sometimes I'm not willing Sometimes I just don't want to feel the shit I don't want to feel. Of course, the irony is I'm feeling it either way. It's in my body, but I still want to fight it. And when that happens, I try to have compassion for myself there too and say, okay, you know, I'm just, I'm just not there. Just, just not, not at that place of acceptance today. And, uh, and that's okay too. I am a flawed, limited human as we all are, but I also have potential. I, I believe in absolute free will. I think whatever we've done in the past, whatever choices we've made in the past, we can make radically different choices at any moment in time. I believe we all have that potential. And I believe psychedelics, more than anything else, just connect us to that reality. So I'm going to log off, but we will post this on the psychedelic. Oh, I should also, let me say who I am because people, this is, oh, no, I want to turn off commenting. Um, comment. This is me. Um, for those who want to keep, oh, I almost forgot something very important. Don't go anywhere. We have, um, yeah. So the SF psychedelic society, they, um, we do an OCD and psychedelic support network. It's essentially not essentially it is. I've been using the word essentially a lot. It is a, uh, a zoom, a conference call that happens on the second Monday of every month where, I share my experience. I, I run it in conjunction with Becky Frankel, who's a really wonderful person, has a lot of insight on OCD and psychedelics as well. So we share our experience, we answer questions, um, and we have a uh, just a very frank, open discussion. So it's totally free. Next one is this Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you want to join, there is a registration link. I will post on my Instagram uh, today or tomorrow. Um, I believe the Psychedelic Society will post it as well, but there's just a free registration. So feel free to check that out. 
And um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks everyone for listening and your questions. And uh, we'll do this again in about a month. Take care.